this is going to be about time and eternity. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite one. So he said, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. God is outside of time. He's not limited to time like we are. In Second Peter 3, 8, it says, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. One thousand years with the Lord is as one day. So it's like, think back to last Thursday, and that's about how long it's been since Adam and Eve in the house of God. I mean, it's been seven days since last Thursday, uh, six, seven days. So that's about how long it's been since Adam and Eve were here to God. If they were here 6,000 years ago, and a 1,000 years is one day, think about how fast that's gone by in the eyes of the Lord. You see, God knows the end from the beginning as well. It says in Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So, uh, right a line across a sheet of paper at the beginning write the beginning at the end write the end and all that from the beginning to the end God has it in his head every little detail even every detail of things that would have took place if you made a different decision let's say tomorrow you're faced with about five different decisions that you could do on something. God would know what would happen no matter what decision you choose. He knows everything that's going to happen from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. He knows the beginning from the end. Imagine something like a DVD player or a YouTube video. You can pause it. You can fast forward it. You can rewind. You can press play. You can even, on a DVD, go to scene selection. I imagine time for God is like that. So you've got time. You wrote on a piece of paper a line that starts at the beginning, goes all the way to the end, and all the human history is on that line. Now, God sees that easier than we see like a DVD. I can go to scene selection, and I can look at anything on that DVD that I want to. I can pause it if I want to. And, you know, God can pause this. I mean, he made the sun to stand still. He can fast forward it. He can rewind it if he wanted to. And the Bible is like God's scene selection. That's like him giving us his scene selection. And we can go back and look at Cain and Abel. We can go forward and look at something in the tribulation. Time is nothing for God. It's less than an hourglass to him. It's just like, you know, we could pick up an hourglass, turn it upside down, shake it back and forth. This world and time is like that for God. It's nothing to him. So why would we even be worried about half the stuff we're worried about when God already knew what was going to happen, knew what would happen no matter which decision we chose or whatever the scenario was? Remember when you were a kid and you watched a movie until you had it memorized? You knew exactly what the characters were going to say before they said it. That's the way God sees time. He sees everything that I'm going to say in this study before I'm even going to say it. Man is limited to time. 
We don't understand eternity. I can't wrap my mind around God and eternity. Like, when I think before the beginning, before Adam, before Lucifer, I can't imagine where God was or what he was doing and how or how it just keeps going further back into eternity. I, I don't understand eternity at all. But ma because man is limited to time, we have an end. We have a beginning. So therefore, our minds can't comprehend it. And no matter how long we live, we still die. Everybody is going to have an end of this life. I mean, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And unless we go out in the rapture, we're going to die. And even if we do go out in the rapture, this current life that we're in is still going to end. And we're going to have a way better life with the Lord. But I want to show you some people who died in the Bible, which was everybody except for a couple. In Genesis 5.5, 5, it says, In all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So he lived all that time, 930 years, and he died. You know when we're like, 17, 18, 19, 20, we think we're going to live forever. It's not really crossing our mind that we're going to die. I was recently at my grandfather's funeral and looking at the pictures that they showed on the DVD showing him from a baby to when he was 80. And you can tell in those pictures when he was young, he's not thinking about death. But then when you get to them pictures of him being 80... You know, it looks like he's weak, and at that time, he is probably thinking about death or wanted to die. So, what I think we should do is think about death while we're young, do what we should do today that we'll wish we did when we were 70, 80, 90 years old. In Adam's case, he should have been doing what he needed to do at 200, 300, 400, 500. You know, he had a lot of time to accomplish things. We got a lot less time to accomplish things. I don't get to live 930 years. Adam probably thought he would live forever when he turned 200. He's like, man, I'm only 200 years old. I, I probably got like 700 years left. You know, he would wake up every day and, and turn over and look at Eve over there next to him. And she, she'd be like, you're 900 years old. Are you not dead yet? You know, his body would be cracked. Imagine... How, how much his body would be cracking when he got out of bed at 900-something years old. Genesis 9, 28 and 29. Here's another character. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. Noah lived a long time before the flood. And here he lives 350 years after the flood. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So Adam lived to be 930, Noah lived to be 950. I mean, these guys are living a long time, but death is conquering everybody at this point because everyone is a sinner. And Hebrews 2.14 said that the devil had the power of death. It shows us that. And the devil is just conquering everybody at this point. And notice the decrease in man's age after the flood. The next real famous character that shows up is Abraham. In Genesis 25, 7 through 8, it says, And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived in hundred three score and fifteen years. So he lived in hundred three score and fifteen years. And Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was, was gathered to his people. So he lived a hundred three score and fifteen years. So if a score is twenty, three score would be sixty. And then 15 years added to that would be 75. So he was 175 years old. So he's a way younger than Noah. Way younger than Adam. Almost 18 years. Or I mean 18. Almost 800 years younger. So. and But it's still calling him an old man. It's still saying he died in a good old age. 
So it's taken into account that decrease in man's age. For that time, he's living a very long time compared to everybody else. But see, they're all dying. Adam, the first man ever, he died. Noah, called a preacher of righteousness, he died. Abraham, called the friend of God, he died. The next guy, even if you're in good health, you still die. In Deuteronomy 34, 7, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Even mighty men like Moses, that his eye wasn't dim, nor his natural force abated, he didn't need reading glasses. He didn't need a hearing aid. He, didn't, he probably didn't even uh, walk with a cane or anything like that. He... He still had his, his youth when it comes to being physical. He, he was still like a young man. Yet he still died at 120 years old. Once again, the age went down. So even if you're in good health, you're still going to die. I had this uncle that was like 90-something years old. And I mean, when I was born, he was old. And I, I just thought he was just ancient my whole life. He always had really white hair really wrinkled up, but he moved around like a 30-year-old. And as far as I know, he did that till he died, but, I mean, he was 95, so he died. I'm not sure why, other than that he was 95. You know, even if you're in good health, you're still going to die. Bodily exercise profiteth little. Death is still coming. I mean, you can't stop death. The strongest man in the world cannot push death away. So, Moses, he died. Even a mighty man after God's own heart will die. In 1 Kings 2, 10 through 12, So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the day, days that David reigned over Israel were forty years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and thirty and three years reigned he in Jerusalem. Then set Solomon up on the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. So even David dies. He reigned over Israel 40 years. He reigned a long time. Uh, David told us the number of days for the average man. You see, David's age went down even further than Moses. Psalm 90 and verse 9 says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that's told. And that's exactly what we do. Looking at those pictures at my grandfather's funeral, I just got to thinking, we do, that. this verse popped in my mind, we spend our years as a tale that is told. Those pictures on the screen are just little tales that we can tell, like, oh, I remember that. I remember when he did that. I remember when we went to that place. It's all just, our memories are like stories but they are not going to amount to anything because this world's going to end. Eternity will begin for everybody one day. You're going to spend eternity in heaven or you're going to spend eternity in hell. We spend our years as a tale that is told. He had a lot of stories that he told me about his life. But now those memories are going to be forgotten. And if you're not saved then that's all you have is little tales that you can tell about your past life. I had a, a, a grandmother that was probably lost. She was like 90-something years old. She lived all those years, 90-something years, and then woke up in hell. That's a scary thought, to live 90-something years and then wake up in hell. Now, my grandfather, I believe he's in heaven. He, he was saved. So, you know, he... His life wasn't like hers, but she she lived 90-something years and then wake up in hell. All them chances to believe the gospel, that is the definition of a tragedy to me. In Psalm 90 and verse 10, David says, The days of our years are three score and years and ten. Three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength 
labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So the days of our years are three score years and ten. So that's seventy. And if by reason of strength they beat four score years, you know, if you're a little bit stronger and a little bit better health, maybe you'll get to eighty. But it's going to be labor and sorrow. I mean, if you're 50 years old, you might have 20 years. And think back 20 years ago to when you were 30. It doesn't seem like that long ago. You might have 20 more years. If you're 60, you might have 10 years or less. I mean, time is just ticking away and you're wasting it on junk, on watching TV, like, in the break room at work, men are wasting all that break time scrolling the phone on Facebook and TikTok. Just talking to each other about a bunch of bull all the time. Why not use your time wisely? You don't have much of it. Solomon says, here's the next guy. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 2.16, For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten, and how dieth the wise man as the fool? The fool's going to die. The wise man's going to die. The things in this life are not going to be remembered, and all that's going to really matter is what you did for God. When it gets to eternity, the only things that are going to count for anything is what you did for God in this life. Solomon, the wisest and richest man ever, he died in 1 Kings eleven forty two through 43. In the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem, over all Israel was 40 years, and Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. So Solomon also dies, and his son had to step in in his place. And Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 6, 3, If a man beget an hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his life be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial. I say that an untimely birth is better than he. It would be better off for him to never have been born than for him to just live all these years and, you know, his soul not be filled with good and that he have no burial. There are some things that it would be better for you to have never been born than to be born and live a hundred years under certain conditions, like to live a hundred years and never do anything for God, never get saved, and just wake up in hell. He says in Ecclesiastes 9-2, All things come alike to all, for there is one event to the righteous, and to the wicked, to the good, and to the clean, and to the unclean, and to him that sacrificeth, and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth is he that feareth an oath. Solomon died. The Apostle Paul died. He says in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. The Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian ever, died. How are you going to spend your short time that you've been given in this life? Are you going to use it for the Lord? Are you going to use it for yourself? Or are you going to use it for the devil? God is so above time and ahead of time that God can even move people around in time as he pleases. You may not have ever thought about this, but God uses a man to tell us what's going to happen in the end. The Apostle John, right? Well, not just him, but all kinds of other men. But you got the Apostle John who in Revelation 1.10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You see... That word, in the Spirit, look at Revelation 17, 3. It says, so he carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness. Look back in Ezekiel. Look at that phrase, in the Spirit. You know, God picks up Ezekiel in the Spirit, carries him by the locks of his hair to some other place geographically. And in John's case, he's taken John somewhere else in time picking him up, carrying him away in the Spirit. You know, John goes to the future, even past what we're in right now, and sees 
the future. That's an amazing thing. And he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So John goes forward in time and tells us the events that's going to take place. He tells us about the rapture in Revelation 4. He tells us about the second coming in Revelation 19. And then John sees the 1,000-year reign in Revelation chapter 20. He sees the devil bound for a 1,000 years and then gets out after the 1,000 years. He sees the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21. You see, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. He's in complete control. He knows everything that you're going through throughout your everyday life. So why should you worry? Why should you fear if the person that's in control knows what's going to happen before it happens? So what you need to do is you need to see time as a gift. God had time, has time in his hand, and he's given you a piece of time, your life. It's not going to be 930 years like Adam. It's not going to be 950 years like Noah. It might not even be 70 years, but he's given you a piece of time, and you need to use it because it's a gift. It can be your biggest enemy, or it can be your best friend. It says in James four thirteen through 15, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So it says your life is a vapor. And every time I read this verse, I think of this message my pastor had at one of the Bible schools. Uh, vacation Bible school he always preaches on the Friday at the end of vacation Bible school and he had he used this verse and he had a Febreze can and he sprayed it and he said that's your life it's just a vapor compared to eternity it's a vapor it appears for a little time and then vanisheth away so what are you going to do with that that God's given you that little vapor in Job 7, 6 through 7, it say, says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Your life is wind. You don't remember all the times that the wind blew across your face. It came and it went. Ecclesiastes 1, 4, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. One generation passeth away. I seen a photo of my grandparents when they were my age. They were younger. In the picture, they obviously were not thinking about death. They were raising kids, living life, not thinking about death at all. But now, my grandfather just passed away. My grandmother, right behind him. I mean, I could die before her. You never know. You know, we're not promised another second. But, I mean, she's getting, she's going to be close to 80. He was 80. Just like that verse said, 70 or 80 years is generally all we're going to get for the most part. One generation passeth away. There was a time when your grandparents had the same mindset that you do right now. They were just living their life, raising their kids. They weren't thinking about death. You need to think about death daily. Think about how you're using your time. Don't wake up and be 80 years old and wish you could go back and live for the Lord where you could have been praying all those years, witnessing all those years, reading the Bible all those years, learning the Bible, teaching the Bible, passing something on to the next generation because your generation is going to pass away just like the previous generation. You need to be putting something together to leave for your kids, whether it be a marked up Bible, a library of Bible knowledge or something that you compile together. Just you need to be working on leaving something behind. You're not going to be here forever. God's gave you a little bit of time. The rapture could happen tomorrow, and your time here is even less than it would be if you lived to be 70 or 80. So just remember this. Time is nothing in light of eternity. God is so above time and ahead of time that God can even move people around in time as he pleases. You may not have ever thought about this, but 
God uses a man to tell us what's going to happen in the end. The Apostle John, right? Not just him, but all kinds of other men. But you got the Apostle John, who in Revelation 1.10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You see, that word, in the Spirit, look at Revelation 17.3. It says, so he carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness. Look back in Ezekiel. Look at that phrase, in the Spirit. You know, God picks up Ezekiel in the Spirit, carries him by the locks of his hair, to some other place geographically. And in John's case, he's taking John somewhere else in time, picking him up, carrying him away in the spirit. You know, John goes to the future, even past what we're in right now, and sees the future. That's an amazing thing. And he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So John goes forward in time and tells us the events that's going to take place. He tells us about the rapture in Revelation 4. He tells us about the second coming in Revelation 19. And then John sees the 1,000-year reign in Revelation chapter 20. He sees the devil bound for a 1,000 years and then gets out after the 1,000 years. He sees the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21. You see, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. He's in complete control. He knows everything that you're going through throughout your everyday life. So why should you worry? Why should you fear if the person that's in control knows what's going to happen before it happens? So what you need to do is you need to see time as a gift. God had time, has time in his hand and he's given you a piece of time, your life. It's not going to be 930 years like Adam. It's not going to be 950 years like Noah. It might not even be 70 years. But he's given you a piece of time. And you need to use it because it's a gift. It can be your biggest enemy or it can be your best friend. It says in James 4, 13 through 15, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So it says your life is a vapor. And every time I read this verse, I think of this message my pastor had at one of the Bible schools. Uh, vacation Bible school he always preaches on the Friday at the end of vacation Bible school and he had he used this verse and he had a Febreze can and he sprayed it and he said that's your life it's just a vapor compared to eternity it's a vapor it appears for a little time and then vanisheth away so what are you going to do with that that God's given you that little vapor in Job 7, 6 through 7, it say, says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Your life is wind. You don't remember all the times that the wind blew across your face. It came and it went. Ecclesiastes 1, 4, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. One generation passeth away. I seen a photo of my grandparents when they were my age. They were younger. In the picture, they obviously were not thinking about death. They were raising kids, living life, not thinking about death at all. But now, my grandfather just passed away. My grandmother, right behind him. I mean, I could die before her. You never know. You know, we're not promised another second. But, I mean, she's getting, she's going to be close to 80. He was 80. Just like that verse said, 70 or 80 years is generally all we're going to get for the most part. One generation passeth away. There was a time when your grandparents had the same mindset that you do right now. They were just living their life, raising their kids. They weren't thinking about death. You need to think about death daily. Think about how you're using your time. Don't wake up and be 80 years old and wish you could go back and live for the Lord where you could have been praying all those years, witnessing all those years, reading the Bible all those years, learning the Bible, teaching the Bible, passing something on to the next generation. 
because your generation is going to pass away just like the previous generation. You need to be putting something together to leave for your kids, whether it be a marked up Bible, a library of Bible knowledge or something that you compile together. Just you need to be working on leaving something behind. You're not going to be here forever. God's gave you a little bit of time. The rapture could happen tomorrow, and your time here is even less than it would be if you lived to be 70 or 80. So just remember this. Time is nothing in light of eternity.